Shabbat Shalom. It's always nice to hear a hearty Shabbat Shalom back. Boy, it is, uh, it's always great to be at Olive Tree and uh, feel like it's kind of a second home for us. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Jeremiah, my wife Hannah, and our kids are here. Uh, we both, Hannah and I both grew up in Jewish believing homes. Uh, her in LA, me in Toronto, Canada. Um, my grandparents on my mom's side were Holocaust survivors from Hungary. And uh, so my brother, my sister, and I, growing up in Toronto, we knew our story, we knew our history as Jewish people. And yet my mom was the first one in our Jewish family to believe in Yeshua. And uh, so that was kind of a miraculous thing. Uh, but I grew up, like many here, as a second generation Jewish believer. And um, uh, in high school, I found out pretty quick this wasn't uh, actually the norm for our people. And it was my testing ground uh, with all sorts of Jewish friends to uh, figure out why I believe what I believe. And uh, it was a great experience. And, and so it kind of prepared me to do what I've been doing for the last 12 years or so, which has been serving full time uh, with Jews for Jesus. And uh, many of you are connected with us and we're grateful for, for that. We also have a number of teens with us this morning because we're, uh, we're doing a teen event at Jews for Jesus. So if you're a teen and you're here for, for the teen event, just wave your hand so everyone can say hi. Is there's, don't be shy. All right, there we go. All right. Can we welcome them? Yeah. We stayed up late last night serving packing tomato seeds to be sent around the world. So uh, I might be feeling maybe a little less tired than, than Dan coming back from his trip. But uh, it's, it's great to be with you this morning. Such an honor and privilege to be able to share God's word with you. Um, you know, there's two things in life that I think all of us struggle with. That's relationships and money. And sometimes, oftentimes, they, they go hand in hand, don't they? They're very much tied together. And um, not so long ago, uh, we got into a, an accident with our van. And thank God everyone was fine and no one was hurt. But our, our car was totaled. And uh, I'd never experienced that before. And I was about four weeks away to leaving on a ministry trip where I would leave Hannah and our four kids stranded alone without any vehicle if I didn't find one fast. So that was a lot of pressure and motivation to, <laughs> to find something. And I spent four weeks searching all over the internet. We were driving all over Chicagoland, all over the western suburbs. Anytime I would find uh, a, a van online that looked like it could be it, I would pack up the kids and, and Hannah and we'd drive, you know, out to Aurora, out to St. Charles, wherever. And just time and time again, anything we looked at, it just came up empty. And I was getting really frustrated and time was ticking down. And I spent days... Uh, vacation days searching for a van, which was not my intent, because I just so desperately needed to solve this big obstacle in front of me, and the more I tried and the harder I tried, the harder I failed, and I just wondered, God, why are you doing this to me? Have you ever asked him that question? <laughs> Has he ever answered? Um, God, this is not great timing. How many of you know crises don't really come in convenient timing? <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. And I had a, a totaled car behind me. I had a deadline in front of me where I was going to leave. And I couldn't move this obstacle. I felt overwhelmed and stuck. I was in a dilemma. And maybe, maybe you can relate a little bit to that. Uh, maybe you're coming in this morning to service and you have a weight on your shoulders that most people don't know about. Maybe your crisis, maybe your obstacle that you are facing is a financial one and you're working really hard to move it and it doesn't seem to move. 
Maybe there's a health situation with you or a loved one, and you try everything you can to do something to see some alleviation, and it doesn't happen. Maybe there's a strained relationship in your family, and uh, the harder you try to make it right, just the worse it gets. But whatever you're walking in this morning, whatever crisis is weighing you down this morning, uh, God has a word for you. And I think we're either all in a crisis, we're coming out of a crisis, or we're heading into a crisis. So the question isn't, isn't, well, what will happen if hard times come? The question is, what will happen when they come, and how will we respond? And I think the, the question of how do we deal with it, this is a question that our Jewish people were certainly asking as they were facing the Red Sea. And so if you want to turn with me to Exodus chapter 15, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 15 this morning. Dean, do I need to move the mic away from my beard? Yes? Okay. I don't want to break Pastor Dan's special mic. I won't be back ever again if I do that. So Exodus chapter 15, we sung it this morning, and it's a central passage in the Torah. It's a significant song, and uh, actually many biblical scholars believe that this is the oldest recorded song in history. I think that's pretty cool, and such, it has a great place in our synagogue services. It's sung in the morning shachri uh, service. It's, uh, we sing it during Passover. Uh, this is where we get our Mika Mocha from. Um, it's recorded in Psalm 118. And um, it's an important song for our people. And my, my me message title this morning is The Greatest Medley. And a medley is where two songs are, are kind of woven together. And here we have the song of Moses. Um, we, we all know the story, uh, but just to recap and most of us have gone through Passover seders recently, but if you remember, chapter 14 tells us about um, uh, the, it's the account of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Remember, Pharaoh said, yeah, you can go, and he let them go, and uh, the, our people got to the Red Sea, and then he decided, wait, I need to chase after them. Put it down? Down. Like that? Is that better? Okay, thanks, Dean. What would we do without Dean? Yeah. Right. So uh, then Pharaoh chases after them, and, uh, you know, then the whole Charleston Heston thing, right? He spreads out his hands. Uh, the seas part. Is that, oh, that, there was a beautiful graphic up there. I like that. Uh, the seas part. We went through. They came chasing after us. The seas covered them. And the first thing that we do when we cross the Red Sea is we sing a song. We sing the song of Moses. Israel was at their point of facing death, um, but what they didn't understand, maybe in that time, but that we could see now, is that Israel's trial set them up for God's victory. Israel's trial set them up for God's victory. And uh, let's read Exodus chapter 15. I'll read verses 1 through 8. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The wa deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. 
uh, which has sustained thousands of years. And we ask you this morning here at Olive Tree that you would make us alive to your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to the hearts of people what you know that we need to hear. Help us not only to be hearers of your word, but doers of it for your name's sake and all God's people said, amen. amen. So um, we cross the Red Sea and we sing this song. And um, the co way I want to look at it this morning uh, briefly with you is sort of three angles that the song gives. Uh, the song talks about God's character. It talks about who God is. The song talks about what God has done for us. And the song forecasts and tells us what God will do for us. So we see that the song of Moses is all about who God is and what he's done. And uh, it's called the Song of Moses, but you know, you've probably picked up that his name isn't mentioned even once. So it's really all about God, right? And um, Moses sings this song, but it's not really about him. And you know what? The best worship songs are not about us, are they? <laughs> They're all about him. And he sings the song, and, and the, the, the holy name of God, yud heh vav uh, is mentioned ten times in this one song, which is pretty significant. So look at verse 1. The Lord is highly exalted. That's who God is, his character. Why? Because the horse and its rider, he is hurled into the sea. That's what God has done. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength, my song, my salvation, my Yeshua, my God, my Father's God. The Lord is a man of war. He's a warrior. That's who God is. Moses is declaring the character of God. And then look at why we can hold on to his character. <clears throat> Verses 4 through 8. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he's hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the sea. The deep waters have covered them. So this is what God has done. So I love how this psalm is constructed. God's character is lifted up, and we can rely on God's character because we remember what God has done for us. Amen? Amen? Just go and pretend you're Baptist this morning. I like, I like when you talk back. It's fine. So... Who God is, what he's done. Who God is, what he's done. And isn't this like the core of our faith? We remember who God is. That's where faith begins. It begins with God. And then we can remind ourselves what he has done for us. He has demonstrated his faithfulness. Now look at how Moses describes what God has done for us. How exactly did God rescue us in the Red Sea? Look at verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. Look at verse 7. You threw them down, those who opposed you. Look at verse 12. You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. So I, I love how Moses repeats this phrase, your right hand. And all throughout the Tanakh, um, the, the right hand symbolizes strength and power and sovereign control. Earlier on in Exodus chapter 3, uh, God says, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. So if you think about it, really the, the Exodus story is a story, it's a battle uh, represented by hands, isn't it? There's Pharaoh and his hand and God and his hand. And the question is, which hand wins? And uh, Moses depicts uh, God like a mighty warrior. And uh, we sing the song of Moses celebrating the mighty right hand of God. And I, I kind of imagine Moses depicting God like this huge giant, you know. He says, your right hand, you threw them down. By your right hand, you washed them away. And um, I, I kind of, in my imagination, I, I, I kind of picture BFG. Ever see the movie, Big Friendly Giant? No? And, you know, like, the, like all the kids are nodding, yeah. So, 
the giant can do more with his pinky than, than all the, the people can do with their army. And that's kind of what God is depicted here. He, in his strength, can do more with one hand tied behind his back than all of Pharaoh can do with all of his strength and his might. Moses goes even a step further. Look at verse 8. He says, by the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. Uh, and and uh, he, he talks about the, the idea of God's weapon is even just his nostrils. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? God doesn't even have to do much. He just has to sneeze and the waters stand up. And it, it's kind of like when, when you get scared or when you're watching a Hallmark movie and you get those little hairs on your arms stand up. Ever have that happen? The guys are like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but just in a moment, how your hairs on your arm can stand up so God breathes and the waters stand up on edge. And uh, if you think about it, look at verse 10. He says, you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. So what's God's weapons here? It's his nose and mouth. That's kind of humiliating to the Egyptian army, isn't it? And uh, if you could use these terms, uh, you could even say that, that God is so powerful, he's such a mighty warrior, his weakest part of him, just breathing, is stronger than all of 600 of Pharaoh's chariots and army. That's the kind of God we serve. All he has to do is breathe and he can rescue us. Why would we doubt him in whatever crisis that you are coming in this morning with? Whatever weight is on your shoulders this morning, know that all God needs to do is and he can rescue you like that. Now, what's interesting is if we backtrack before the Song of Moses, the Israelites are there at the Red Sea. They, they turn behind them and they see the dust flinging in the sky. They can kind of feel the ground trembling as 600 of Pharaoh's best chariots are now chasing toward them. And they're, they're thinking to themselves, we're going to die. We're either going to get speared to death or we're going to get drowned to death. Boy, what are the options? Which should we choose? And, and now, now the Israelites, they retreat in their hearts, and they want to go back to Egypt. That's always where we fall, isn't it? We want to go back to where it's comfortable. They said, did you bring us out here to kill us, Moses? I mean, the melons were better in Egypt, and now we're going to die out here in the desert. And and they retreat, they lost faith, they were driven to fear, and they resented being saved from Egypt because they wanted to go back from where God delivered them. How many of us tend to just get drawn back to the places where God is delivering us out of because it's comfortable and our sin is comfortable? And so in their fear... They're trying to solve it on their own. They're thinking, maybe we can just go back. Maybe we'll tell Pharaoh, it was a big mistake. <laughs> just joking. We'll come back. We'll serve you. It's fine. Right? They're trying to figure it out in their own strength. And listen to what Moses tells them. They're trying to use their own rationale. In chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, when they're facing their crisis, when they're facing this trial, and they have no idea how they're going to escape, how God is going to deliver them yet, before the song of, is even sung, listen to what Moses tells them. Chapter 14, 13 and 14. He says this. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance, or the Yeshua, the salvation, that the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Say that with me. Be still. Be still. Moses is telling them, you don't get it. You don't have to worry. Now remember, our people left Egypt 
armed for battle. Remember that? We, we plundered the Egyptians. We left on our quick Passover meal. And uh, we left with spears and swords and ready for battle. But you see, what we didn't understand was that battle was not ours to fight. We were armed, but God didn't need us to fight this battle. In fact, he probably doesn't need us to fight most of the battles we're in. And maybe God is saying to some of you this morning, don't be afraid. This is not your battle to fight. You only need to be still. Now listen, don't take what I'm saying out of context because Moses told them, be still. But it wasn't just like, relax on your couch and just watch God do his work. They needed, the very next verse says, now move forward. <laughs> be still, move forward. What a conundrum, right? And actually in the Hebrew, it's better translated, shut up, stop the complaining. Quiet your mouths. God's had to tell us that a few times, hasn't he? Stop it. Stop the complaining and move forward, meaning walk toward the sea. Walk by faith. Don't go back. Be quiet. Let, the God, let God fight for you and walk forward. And I'm wondering this morning, whatever's weighing on your heart, whatever trial that you can think of in your mind right now that you're facing, I wonder if it's a battle that you don't need to fight. Now, there are some that God calls us to. But a lot of times, we're fighting things that God never intends for us to fight. He says, I'll fight for you. I will fight for you. And you know, some of us are really, um, we're really ambitious. We, don't only, we not only fight our own battles, we fight other people's battles. Yeah, we look at our friends and we see that they need help and we're going to fight for them. Mm -hmm. Without even them asking. Can you hear God say to you this morning, be still, I will fight for you. Just move forward in faith, don't retreat in fear. What are you gonna do with your trial? Can you see, even as the Israelites didn't yet see, that whatever trial you are in, God is setting you up for his victory? Can you see that through the faith, eyes of faith this morning? So the Song of Moses talks about who God is, his character, and what he has done, but it also forecasts what he will do. Listen to how the Song of Moses ends, verses 17 and 18. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary O oh Lord, your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. So this song, this is a poem, and it's a pivotal song in the Torah because right here, Moses prophesies about the city that God will call Jerusalem, the place where he will live. He even talks about the mountain of your inheritance. He's talking about Mount Moriah, he talks about the sanctuary that's going to be built, which has not been built yet. So here Moses, at the end of his song, they've been delivered by the sea, and now he's singing about the future, what God will do. There's going to be a mountain, and there's going to be a place where God, you and your people, are going to live forever. And look what it says, the Lord will reign. Say reign. Um, that's kingly language, isn't it? God's going to reign as king forever and ever. It's beautiful because the song opens up with God being highly exalted, and the song closes with God, with, closes with God reigning. So this beautiful kind of sandwich, or as scholars like to say, an inclusio, but it's a sandwich, right, of God's kingly reign. And, and the song is beautiful, but it's incomplete. Why? Because for 1,500 years after this song, our people would not see the end of the song. We wouldn't see that last part of the song that Moses was beautifully telling us about. The king and the mountain and the temple and Jerusalem. 
And the song hints at another song. But the song, that other song isn't seen for a long time. But thankfully, we get a sneak peek of it. I said the message that this morning was entitled the, the Greatest Medley. And of course, with a medley, you need two songs. So what's the song that Moses is hinting at that we don't see here yet? I'll read it for you, Revelation chapter 15. Uh, Moses anticipates the song that is going to be sung. And John tells us about a sight that parallels our scene in the text. There's a sea, and there's people standing beside it, victorious over an enemy. Sound familiar? Listen to verse 3. It says, they, sang, they held harps given them by God. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. You see, the song of Moses anticipates the song of the Lamb. And here now we have the greatest medley the world would ever hear. Because 1,500 years after Moses sang this song, uh, God would send his son to climb Mount Moriah, that mountain that Moses sung about, to die in that city, Jerusalem, that Moses sung about. And he would carry on his shoulders every pain, every death, every sin, and he would fight for us. And how would he do that? With his mighty hands that were outstretched. His mighty hands were pierced for you and me so that we could be redeemed from the ultimate enemy of death. Amen? And in Yeshua's greatest trial, the, the, his death on the cross, that was a setup for the greatest victory the world would ever know, the resurrection and the ascension. And so then we get to sing about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And the song of the Lamb is gives us the fuller picture because Yeshua is the king. He's r sitting on the throne and he's coming again and all the nations will be gathered before him and they will pay homage and honor and worship Yeshua the king. The greatest medley the world has ever known. The song of, of, of the lamb tells us who God is. It's Yeshua. Tells us what he's done. He's rescued us, and it tells us what he will do. He will come, and he will reign as king forever. So what does this mean for you? As Pastor Dan and, and my old friend Jan would say, so what? Um, what's weighing on your heart this morning? The trial that's standing in your way, um, whether it's a sea of depression uh, or a weight uh, of, of emotions, whether it's finances, friends, or family, whatever trial you're facing, um, here's the practical little takeaway that I want to offer you. As you think about that trial weighing on your heart, I just want you to look at your hand and say, God's hand is bigger. Can we do that on the count of three? Just look at your hand. I want, and on the count of three, we're going to say God's hand is bigger. Ready? One, two, three. God's hand is bigger. See, God's hand is bigger. We don't have to rely on our own strength because God's hand is bigger. You don't have to have the weight of your shoulders to fight whatever you're, you're facing because God's hand is bigger. I, I told you at the beginning that uh, I had some van problems, and, and the short story is... God often waits to the 11th hour <laughs> to, to, to come through. And the night before I was supposed to leave for a week, stranding my wife and my children with no vehicle, God provided someone in my congregation who was a salesman. He found a car. He brought me down to the dealership. He negotiated the price. Hallelujah. Uh, he, he brought the price down, and God provided an even better van than I could even anticipate it. And in all of my strength, God did with a 
breath of his nostrils what I couldn't do with all of my strength because God's hand is bigger. But just so you know that life isn't all tidy, just a couple months ago, our beautiful, miraculous van had a really big uh, repair <laughs> that needed to be done. And it emptied our savings. And I worried all over again. I was retreating back. <laughs> and I had to remember my, uh, th this idea that God's hand is bigger. And okay, God, we've emptied our savings to fix this wonderful van you provided. <sighs> I guess if you provided it, you'll provide again. And you'll take care of us again. Because God's hand is bigger. Let's pray. And I just invite you just to take a few seconds in your own heart to ask God what he would want you to do with the message that you heard this morning. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to our hearts, telling us what you want us to do with what we've heard. We thank you that we can rely on your character because you, you never change. We can rely on your faithfulness that you've proven yourself to us over and over again. We thank you that with your mighty hand, your hands were pierced for us. You were raised from the dead and you are coming again to reign and rule as king. And thank you that your hand is bigger than ours. You can do what we cannot do. And I pray my friends this morning would be able to trust in you to be still and walk forward in faith, knowing that we can have full confidence in our God who saves. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.